Hello and welcome back to irishracing.com's Jump To It show where we'll be previewing seven races from this weekend's action. The highlight of course being the Charlie Hall chase which we will come up to first but before we get into the races just want to introduce my guests today Stephen Harris from Betting Expert and Ed Quigley. Now Stephen I'll start with you. On our Monday show on uh, Irish Racing we discussed the big cash out that a punter had. I think he could have won what was it over 450 grand before the last leg but he took uh, what was it 57,000. Just wanted to get your take on that story and also what would you, you would what would you have done in that situation? Well I, I think that um, I haven't read completely the details of it but obviously the punter would be devastated that he chose to cash out um i think also that a lot of people have pointed out that it was an extremely ungenerous offer uh, and that he should have been offered quite a lot more so i suspect there's probably more to come from this story i mean generally speaking um, when you're offered cash outs they're never a good idea there's probably a better way of doing things um you're 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 paying the sort of margin twice to the bookmaker uh, whenever you're offered any of these cash outs uh, and, and there's the, the problem can be, of course, what, what he probably should have done is laid some of it back on the exchange and he'd have benefited by several thousand. But of course, he, he, he's probably a small punter and he hasn't got tens of thousands worth of liquidity in his Betfair account. But I'm sure they could have come to some arrangement. But anyway, it's still a nice win. Great, great selections. I mean, the last one was a, you know, I don't think the person having the bet was a, was a guesser because the last one was extremely well backed and completely unexposed. Um, so he was absolutely on the money with his selections. And uh, Ed, your take on that story as well? Yeah, I only caught the fleeting headlines just to say um, social media went into uh, meltdown, didn't it? Oh, why did you cash out? Why well, would have taken the money and all these big arguments, as, as you say? Like, I suppose there's always that part of you thinks, well, if you put the bet on in the first place thinking they'd all win, why would you then duck out of it? But I suppose that, you know, the, the temptation's there and. No, I don't know the, the circumstances, the person or the bet, but, you know, £57,000 there or thereabouts is a, is a is a fair sum of money, isn't it? It shouldn't be sniffed at, but as you say, as Stephen says, that could have been an extra 400000 in the bank. I suppose there's that one school that thought if you're going to place that bet, I think it was a lucky 63 or something like that, wasn't it? Why not just have a, a, a £5 acro that cashed out the uh, the multiple side of things and just left the... Uh, the five pound accumulator going on for X thousand in the last as a kind of an appeasement. But as you say, we could all sit here and offer our opinions. Uh, totally different if you're you're shaking uh, on a Saturday afternoon, hovering over the cash out button with uh, X thousands flying around as potential uh, potential winnings. But um, no, no, at the end of the day, well done to them. It was uh, yeah. So as Stephen says, some uh, very insightful picks in that bet. Well, speaking of insightful picks, hopefully that's what we've got lined up for the viewers today. So as I mentioned before, we're going to start off with the Charlie Hall chase at Weatherby. Uh, now, Ed, you actually mentioned that you're actually quite close to the track. So just give us an update on the conditions and how you think the course is going to be running at Weatherby on Saturday. Yep, I'll be going to, I'll be attending the uh, the racing at Weatherby on Saturday. Really looking forward to it, uh, Joe. Should be a cracker. Yeah, a bit, a bit of rain around. I think it's good to soft, good in places at the time of recording. Uh, but quite a few showers forecast. I, I'd be shocked if there was a lot of good left in the ground by the time they go to post. I think it's going to be that type of no-excuse racing ground, really. Good to soft, October ground. Uh, weather be a, a fair track, uh, I think you'd, you'd probably say. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say a speed track, but it's flat enough. And uh, it's, it's a fair enough test at three miles. But generally speaking, unless the ground gets really deep there, they're not... They're not coming home legless. I mean, of course, we saw absolute carnage in this race 12 months ago where the Dan Scouts were trained Chamblou was going to win by about nine fences uh, until he crashed out and Fusil Raffles kind of um, mopped up the pieces. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Should be lovely jumping ground. Should be a good day. And um, uh, I'm, I think it was 2017 the last time I attended this meeting. So, yeah, very much looking forward to um, getting back from Weatherby's biggest jumping day of the year, I suppose. Great stuff. And on to the Charlie Hall itself then. I mean, we talked, touched on it a little bit, but uh, Brave Man's game against Ahoy Senor looks like it's going to be on the, uh, in terms of the betting. But Stephen, you're looking a little bit elsewhere beyond the two at the head of the market. Well, no, I, I prefer Brave Man's game, uh, Joe, to be honest with you. There is a late non-runner here, which has just come through. Christian Williams' win my wings has cut his leg this morning at home and misses the race. So we're down to six, which is pretty new news. Uh, we're recording this on Thursday, of course. Uh, the one thing about this race, it's a very, very interesting race. I suspect some of them will not be ridden to maximum effect because when you go down them, 
El Dorado Alan, front runner. Paint the Dream, front runner. Ahoy Senor, front runner. Brave Man's Game, front runner. Secret Investor, front runner. They're all horses who are at their best when dominating. Now, I suspect El Dorado Alan will not be gunned from the tape. He's not absolutely a guaranteed stayer at three miles. He did win on decentish ground at Newbury over two miles seven, but he was sunk without trace on his last run at Aintree over an extended three mile one. Um, I doubt that this would be his game plan. Paint the Dream was 25 lengths clear at halfway last time we saw him out. He's not good enough. I don't think they'll try and lead over three miles with him. Sam Brown's liable to get outpaced and isn't good enough. Um, secret investor we haven't seen for 20 months and as I say win my wings is a non-runner now so I did think it concerned the front two and I much prefer uh, Brave Man's game Nichols absolutely flying suddenly his horse have really hit for me this this sounds a daft thing to say Joe but on a Saturday Paul Nichols is absolutely lethal he primes these horses to be ready for these big days for the prize money days uh, and Brave Man's game well when he won first time out over fences at Newton Abbott last season, I don't think I've ever seen a round of jumping like it from a novice. He was absolutely brilliant. He gained a length at every fence leading on his own, and he won his next three very impressively. Now, he did get beaten out of sight on his final run behind the Hoy Senor, which is going to divide opinions, but basically he wasn't right that day. It was one run too many. He got very tired. Um, I think they're going to be positive. Cobden will try and lead. I suspect he'll be at a fitness advantage over a Hoy Senor. Lucinda Russ has been having a few winners, but I'd say generally they've been needing a run. And I suspect Brave Man's Game is going to take this from the front, make all, and jump them into the ground. It, it might not be that competitive a race. Well, hopefully it will be, though, just for the spectacle of it. I mean, looking at it last time out, obviously a Hoy Senor did get the better of Brave Man's Game. Uh, but, Ed, what are you expecting from the Charlie Hall? Yeah, I'm, I slightly disagree with Stephen and said, so I wonder if this could be um, run slightly differently. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover here. Essentially, look, I think Ahoy Senor, Brave Man's Game, clearly are the two with the most potential. Looking at the bigger picture here, so I wonder if there are, uh, this is a good race. But listening to kind of the trainer vibes, there are other days ahead with a few of the horses in here. Uh, obviously, Brave Man's Game, Paul Nichols said, everything revolves around the King George uh, this season. Ahoy Senor kind of vibes are will be straight enough for his seasonal reappearance so when i hear that that basically means we'll come on for the run um yeah. el dorado allen i see the tis are saying they're using this as a stepping stone to the betfair chase uh, at the end of november so i just wonder if there's a little bit of tune-ups going on here uh, i wonder if brave man's game uh, to briefly cover the tactics will be ridden a bit more patiently here because I think the, the big joker in the pack could be the Paul Nichols second string here, Secret Investor, who I do think will be ridden forward under Briarly. And yes, hasn't been seen for nearly two years, but this horse has an unbelievable record when fresh. Really does. Uh, just seems to kind of pull these uh, rabbits out of the hats and was last seen beating Clander Zobo, of course, who's a, who's a class act, multiple King George winner. And Secret Investor caused an upset by beating him in the Denman chase when last seen. Now, again, just reading the trainer trainer comments, Paul Nichols, news that old cliche, has said uh, he'll be trained to the minute for this secret investor. This is his gold cup. Uh, and so with that kind of logic of there are other days ahead and uh, much bigger targets for some of these other horses further down the line, this is secret investor's race. He's 10 rising 11. He's getting weight from his rivals. He will be absolutely tuned to the minute. I imagine he'll go forward under Bryony. Uh, kind of Frodon style, and he will just try and, and go for it from the front. Um, in six months' time, he get lapped, but this isn't six months' time. So I just wonder if first time out, this could be Secret Investors' race. It is a shame, as Stephen has touched upon, we've kind of been losing runners right, left and centre for this race over the last three or four days. I think there were 10 in it uh, a couple of days ago. We're now down to the six, so the each-way terms are obviously shrinking up. But uh, I wouldn't be shocked if first time out, Secret Investor really served it up to them. All in all, though, it's a high-class field. It's intriguing. A Hoy Senor and Brave Man's Game seem to be in around for about 10 years, don't they, with the amount of times we've been talking about their battles. And um, it seems to just keep going flip-flopping between the two of them, between Kempton or Aintree. And, uh, fascinating, fascinating race. But um, I do think the value play here could be Secret Investor. I like it. I like it a lot. So Brave Man's Game from Secret Investor looks like the uh, consensus. Uh, let's move on to Ascot. We're going to go over to the next race on... Well, the next race on the programme, so the one thirty. Two mile Goshen going novice chasing. Obviously, I was there actually on the Friday at Cheltenham Triumph Hurdle. 
Oh, that was devastating. But I mean, how Ed, I just want to get your point of view on how he's kind of come back from that devastation at the festival. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> Goshen's is a little bit of an enigma. I mean, Gary Moore says himself, he's, you know, as for kind of four man or acts, try and say, oh, you know, right handed, left handed, deep ground, you know, tongue ties, headgear, whatever. He said, look, it's if Goshen wants to do it, Goshen wants to do it. What is clear is that he does seem to have a bit of a, an affinity for right handed track with substantial giving the ground. You know, when he won it, Wincanton. Uh, last year, it, it was pretty much bottomless. He's, he's got very good form going right-handed. I think he won a win canton the year before as well, didn't he? When he won big song for someone by a distance, that was in bottomless ground. He's, uh, he's got good Ascot form as well. So right-handed and soft ground does tend to help him. But I'm going to want crash helmet on. I'm going to be hiding behind the sofa with my armour, watching him go over fences for the first time. This mm. Look, he could absolutely, his raw class could absolutely just blast his field to bits. Small field, he could go off. Uh, it'd be see you later, alligator. And as I said, they won't see which way he goes. But I'd be a bag of nerves, to be honest with you. Uh, I I wonder if Gal Road is a little bit dismissed in the market here. Yes, the horse is out of the handicap. And as we discussed on last week's show, the Nigel Twister Davis team are uh, unusually quiet for this time of year. I think they've had what, three winners in the whole of October, which is a bit bizarre. But I know it's during the week, a few of theirs are just starting to run a bit better. Gal Road, who went to Perth. Uh, I'm reliably informed by some um, some paddock experts that he was carrying more condition than me after uh, two five guys. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wonder if um, he will strip a lot fitter for that outing. He had some smart hurdles form last year. He won it bolted up at the November meeting over hurdles uh, when he took the field apart in, in that competitive handicap. And yeah, I just think he, A, he would have stripped fitter for that outing. He should have learned from that experience. He's getting lumps of weight here from Goshen. And uh, again, although he's out of the handicap, I just, Goshen would make me very nervous so, o over fences first mm. time of asking. So Gal Road for me is the value play. And uh, yeah, Stephen, look, just touching on one of the points that Ed raises there, just the time off that horses have. I mean, when it is a seasonal reappearance or it's been a long break, I mean, how do you kind of factor that into your punting? Well, uh, the, the exchanges are a fantastic guide, as is stable form. But Goshen had a run on the flat um, the other day at Goodwood and ran fairly well. Um, so I don't think fitness is going to be a, a massive issue there for him. Um, but I, I, I agree with Ed, um, as is often the case. He's not for the faint hearted, is he, Goshen? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Gary Moore's horses have been needing the run as well. I mean, I backed a horse last weekend, editor de Gite, seven to two out to nine on the exchanges. Confirmed front runner with a brilliant track record in a valuable race on a Saturday. Dropped out, out the back last, never landed a blow. Um, so you've got to tread carefully. The market with Goshen is going to be a fantastic guy. I mean, to be honest, my mindset in this race when I looked at the decks and there was a lot more than four runners was I thought Goshen was one to absolutely lay a place because he could come home alone and win by 25 lengths if he takes to it and he jumps fluently and he routes them. He's got over a stone in hand on rating, hurdle ratings, probably more. Um, but he is a candidate for A, going on the floor, and the horses are lunatic. I mean, I, I agree with Ed up to a point, but I'm not so sure it's got much to do with going right hand or left hand. I think he's a very, very funny horse. I mean, he got beat at Lingfield over hurdles last season in a three-horse race. He was hanging all over the place um, round the track, and I've seen him disappear at Wing Canton as well, and then go on and win. I mean, he's got a terrific engine. Um, another thing to say... Um, he wants really testing ground for me, Goshen. He's not guaranteed to get it, Ascot. I mean, they're good to soft at the minute. Looking out my window, it's sunny and 20 degrees. So it's not at the moment going to be getting any more testing unless we get loads of rain in the next couple of days. So that would be a slight question mark. I mean, the, the one I did like here was Cobbler's Dream, a yard I like, Ben Case. He's around five to one. Um, he's got the scope and size to be a chaser. Uh, he won a couple of times over hurdles last season, then rather lost his way in better races at the end of the season. But he's a really nice horse, um, a good stable. He's sure to be well-schooled. He's been entered up in about three or four races in the last week. So they've come for a good, bit of good prize money. Um, Sam Arive, Chase Debut, interesting, progressive handicap for Nichols. G Gal Road, I can see it, but I backed him the other day at Perth. Now, Twiston Davis has been needing a run as well. He didn't jump that well at Perth, and he got a soft lead as well. He was a bit proppy into the fences. Well, Goshen is a front runner, so that wouldn't help Gal Road. That'd be a bit of a negative. But I agree with Ed that I think you're inclined to have a bet here because you couldn't back Goshen at a short price. Um, I, I thought Cobbler's Dream might be the one if he takes to it first time. Lovely stuff.
So moving on to the 205 at Ascot, we have, uh, I wanted to highlight the form here actually of uh, Alan King lately and Tom Cannon. Together they've got a 40% win rate uh, in the last 21 days. So surely that's an all signs point to call of the wild. Uh, Ed, I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yard really going well. They had a good winner at Chepstow, didn't they? On uh, I think it was on handicap debut earlier in the week. Yeah, Yard clicking nicely. Um, Tom Cannon, probably a bit of an underrated uh, jockey, isn't he? In the in the way in room and naturally a lot of eyes on uh, Edward Stone, who I think is coming back in the Schlur chase, isn't he? In a fortnight at the Cheltenham's November meeting, and then before they decide whether they start trying to clash horns with the likes of a, a Nergamine and Shishkin or whether they move him up in trip. But yeah, in regards to this race, this 205 at Ascot, I thought was was fairly wide open, to be honest with you. Again, it's a tricky one in terms of horses reappearing, perhaps needing the run. You've got horses who should have stripped a lot fitter for their recent outing, like Broomfield Berg uh, for the Nicky Henderson team. Uh, all in all, I thought this was too tricky to call, Joe. So I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to sit this one out. Yeah, I think, Stephen, you're kind of with me, right, in thinking uh, Call of the Wild looks the, the best angle into the race. Yeah, um, Alan King's flying, as you say. Tom Cannon, brilliant jockey. I'm sure he's destined for the top. He deserves to get a full-time job, possibly, with King. Uh, he's riding really well. I do like Call of the Wild. Um, he took a bit of settling earlier on. He's got a smart turn of foot. If the ground continues to dry up at Ascot, I think that'll be in his favour. A handicap's going to suit him. Um, he, as I say, the stronger gallop will help him. Ascot should be ideal. Everything looks in place for a big run. I mean, again, it's a bit of a market race. You've got John Joe's got the favourite. Any harm in asking? He was very progressive last season. Could be extremely well handicapped. JP's got two. Broomfield Berg of Henderson. Now, my, my th Henderson's are needing a run, in my opinion. The ones that are first time out, they've been weak in the market and mostly disappointing in the past week. So the market will be fascinating there. And JP's Call of the Wild is my selection. Um, I think Call of the Wild's one of those horses which. This is going to sound uh, nonsense, but I would sooner take nine to two uh, than I would take eight to one. I'd sooner be with the move than against it. Th these green and gold drifters would not have a fantastic record, to put it politely, and I I'd sooner take shorter. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Call of the World was very much the first string and Broomfield Berg was a very big drifter on Saturday, close to the off. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Um, so let's move on to the next race on the card where I think here, Ed, you've got a uh, angle into the race, the 225, the Bet365 Mares Hurdle, looking at the favourite, Molly's uh, Molly Ollie's Wishes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd be with the favourite here. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it does look a, a, a two-runner race on paper. I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the other three, but uh, Nina de Terrier, A, needs really quick ground, which I don't think uh, she's guaranteed to get uh, then Isla McGee's got to find, what, £30 with the top two. And uh, C the C, uh, although in receipt of £6, still uh, comes out six or seven pounds wrong at the weights, if you like. So I think it lies between the, the two big guns. It's a, it's a match between Molly Zolly's wishes and Martello Sky. Martello Sky does get me a little bit nervous because she does have a good record when fresh. But I just think this is Molly Ollie's wishes race. I mean, she absolutely hacked up in this last year. One by five lengths in a common canter, really impressive performance, and I just think every, this, look, everything about this assignment she's going to be geared towards. I can't see what else they would be doing with her. Let's just say she won this in devastating fashion twelve months ago. What I would like to see is uh, more the rain than merrier for her. She has a, a sensational record on very deep ground. It wasn't actually that deep twelve months ago. I think it was good to soft, uh, and and she coped with it fine. But if it got even deeper. It wouldn't be a problem if you see what I'm saying. So I think there is still another five to six millimetres of rain forecast uh, at the track uh, by the time they, they go to post. So, yeah, that won't be a problem. Looks a match better on paper. Officially, uh, uh, on on the kind of the weights, she comes out wrong at the weights with Martello Sky. Um, it, it, it's a fascinating contest, but uh, I do think everything should be absolutely spot on for Molly Ollie's wishes. So, yeah, I, I'm really keen on her chances, Joe. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight here as well what I'm showing on the screen uh, with irishracing.com. You can also filter the results of the form line by specific going. Uh, so using the little icon on the left side, uh, so you can then speak. Like Ed correctly uh, assesses or shows that the soft and heavy or soft ground, Molly, Molly Ollie's wishes, does very well in that, those conditions. So yeah, I just wanted to point out that you can dig deep into the form lines filter out things in on, on, on irishracing.com to kind of help you assess the form. Um, but Stephen, your take on the race, please. Yeah, I mean, it could be trappy and tactical. That's the only thing. I think C the C 
who's got a stone and upwards to find and isn't good enough, will probably lead on her own, which will be a big plus. And Donna McCain is definitely flying, and there's no fitness doubts about that one. So maybe from a trading point of view, I could see that one getting a soft lead and lasting for quite a long time. Um, Nina the Terrier's form with Sonic Gino at Chepstow got a boost this week when the winner went in again by miles on the bridle. So that's had a bit of a boost. And Nina the Terrier's fit. Again, I don't think she's the class of the top two at all. Uh, the outsider looks impossible. Island Mahi, don't fancy that. So Molly Zolly's wishes. Dan Skelton, smooth traveller with a turn of foot. Um, she is, and she's got her ideal conditions, as Ed says. Dan's had six winners from his last 45 runners. Um, which is below what perhaps what you'd slightly expect. And lots of them have been needing a run. He's had a few run quite badly, in truth. Um, Martello Sky comes from a yard. Lucy Wadden hasn't really had a run as she's naught from four at the time of recording in the last fortnight. So that would be a concern. I mean, I just thought six to four and five to two, uh, I'd probably go with Martello Sky. But I think it, it could be a tactical little race. And again, um, it'll be a race. The exchanges will be very revealing close to the off. Whether or not Dan's got this one A1, 100% fit and ready, or if she's just shy, um, it'll be an interesting race. My, my only opinion, really, is that I think See the C will lead on her own, and she might be some sort of trading angle that you could back mm. her to lay her back quite cheaply after a couple of hurdles. All right, nice piece of advice there, Stephen. Uh, let's move on to the next, so the 240 at Ascot. And uh, before midnight is your market leader here. So, uh, Stephen, again, take us through this one, please, and uh, how you yeah. came to your pick. Yeah, before midnight, um, it's been entered up three or four times in the last fortnight. Keep taking him, at, him out because of the ground's been too quick, but he's probably got good soft, softish ground at Ascot. Perfect. Very progressive young chaser. Three from 12 over fences. Been a revelation for Sam Thomas, who's a really good trainer going places. Who did well with a lot of these horses last season. Before midnight, sure to be fit. Ascot, absolutely ideal. I think the key with him, he's got Sam uh, Twiston Davis booked, who's brilliant from the front. And before midnight is definitely best dominating. Now, there's one or two others who could spoil here, but Gumball being the main one I'm worried about. They don't always lead on Gumball, but when they do, he's a real freewheeler. So he could be a spoiler. But if Gumball doesn't ruin before midnight, I think he'll get into a nice rhythm and gain ground at the fences and try and fend them all off. He's a, he's a tough and likeable handicapper. And uh, Ed, have you got anyone beyond the favourite here? Uh, very tricky race. I think we're, just as we're recording, Diego de Charmille's come out. He's a non-runner, so um, the complexion changing a little bit. Obviously, he's a previous winner uh, of this assignment. Uh, I thought it was really tricky. I mean, Nassalam, Ascot, bit of cut in the ground, right-handed, Gary Moore, uh, almost Gosham part two. Um, yes, everything's right for him, although he's on a career-high mark of 145, so that put me off a little bit on seasonal reappearance, just whether he'd strip fitter for the outing all in all i thought this is a proper head scratcher joe so yeah i'm not going to try and uh, bluff my way through with a selection i think i i think you could run this race uh, half a dozen times and get half a dozen winners in my view so what i'm very happy to sit on the fence with not a problem that's completely fine we'll get to your tips later on in the show we may be a bit more confident on but let's move on now back to weatherby so the three o'clock the bet 365 hurdle and uh, now your old favorite ed uh, thomas darby goes in this one tell us more about the race yeah, this is, a, this is a real head scratcher. This is fascinating, isn't it? Uh, Thomas Darby, as you say, fourth in this last year and then came on a bundle for his seasonal reappearance because he went to, to Newbury for the long distance hurdle and won easily. Um, Ollie Murphy says he's changed things up a little bit with him this time around. He's had the wind up. He's a bit more forward. He could be a lot straighter and come here on his A game, but he's got to give weight away uh, for that, that. He's got that Newbury penalty. He's got to give weight away Sporting John who um, looked pretty smart last year, missed an engagement at the Charter Festival with injury. Uh, and then you've got Indefatigable, of course, who won this race last year, beating Proschema. So there's form lines tied in there. Oscar will eaten three under through five. Uh, the cynical side of me, I think they're both here uh, with a prep run to protect their marks with the uh, Coral Gold Cup at Newbury in mind in a month's time. Well, that's the way I view it anyway, especially Oscar Elite. If you remember going back about five years or so ago, or six years now, actually, uh, they did a very similar thing with Native River. Uh, he came back over hurdles this race, ran a cracker in this, of course, didn't affect his chase mark. Then he went to Newbury and uh, and went and won the, the big race, the Hennessy or Labrooks Trophy or whatever it, it was back in 2016. So news this is a springboard for fitness, really, for the rest of the season. So there's, there's a bigger picture going on here. 
There's horses that are going to be right for the day. There's horses who are using this as prep runs to go back over fences. Um, in the case of Indefatigable, I imagine she'll be tuned up to this to the minute. Uh, keep your eyes on the weather with her, though. She wouldn't want it any really softer than good to soft. Something to bear in mind. She's she generally is a I'd say a spring round mare, but the point being she likes on top of the top of the ground. So again, I'm finding it's a right old muddle. You've got Sporty John on the reappearance after injury, and I was reading the Philip Hobbs stable tour saying, well, he was entered up in the London Gold Cup. They might he might run here, and depending on how this gets on, they might then back go go back over fences with him. So <laughs> it's this type of race, uh, Joe. I think tread carefully. Uh, I'd imagine the Dan Skelton runner and the Paul Weber runner are fired up to win here and it, i'd just be keeping your eyes on the ground especially uh, with last year's win it indefatigable if it got too soft that probably count against her my old friend thomas darby if you get 10 to 1 that's probably a fair bet in the sense that if he is uh, a lot fitter first time out after the wind up he could be in the shake up too so uh as a general rule i'd be against three under through five and oscar elite and that the other four I'll leave it to Stephen to take the dance floor. Very, very tricky to call. As I said, I think there are other agendas and there are other targets in mind here. Mm. And for some of these, this could just be a, a glorified ring removal, uh, rust, you know, kind of rust removal job. And we won't really know until they're dropping out the back of the television. Well, Stephen, uh, take it away then. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it hasn't got a very friendly punter shape to it, has it? Six runners. McManus has got the favourite sporting John, who's had a checkered career. I mean, he did revive over hurdles to win a couple of handicaps last season at Cheltenham and Warwick. He was well ridden by Coleman um, on his final start. Best speed in a tactical little race around Warwick. Um, he's a very smart horse. He didn't really take to chasing eventually, although he did, was a great one winner, of course, at Sandown. But things went wrong over fences. And that, that sort of comments apply, as Ed says, to some of these others. Thomas Darby's had a checkered career. Um, the bottom one indefatigable, Paul Webber's. A trainer I avoid like the plague, to be honest with you. He has about five winners a year. I'm not a massive fan, I think, to, from a punting point of view. He tends to go in a sort of patch, usually in the spring, when the ground dries out. In, Indefatigable did win this race last year. Um, fit from a run on the flat, as, as she was last year as well. So, respect her mm. claims. I thought that Prashima could be the one, because she's he's race fit, rather. So, I keep getting the genders wrong. He's race fit, Prashima. Um, I thought ran really well in a warm race at Chepstow the other day behind Napa's Hill, which is good form. Um, Travelling quite strongly on the bridle under a patient ride and not knocked about, has got tired from about two out. So with that run under his belt, back up in trip, I think Prashima is bound to run well. Again, Joe, it's a fascinating race. I mean, the firms have priced it up in the dark. Seven to four favourite Sporting John. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Sporting John was four to one. Genuinely, I think mm. the market could be well at it. It could easily need the run with other targets down the line. And as I say, these green and gold drifters, not many of them win. And I wouldn't be surprised if this was an extremely weak one. I actually wouldn't be totally amazed if Prashima didn't start favourite with Indefatigable. Interesting. Yeah, so one to keep an eye on, I think, just in terms of yeah future form lines as well. Um, so no solid selection from Har Pundits, I think it's fair yeah. to say in this one. Now we're going to move on to our final race that we're going to cover kind of more in depth. So the 315 at Ascot, the London Gold Cup. I think we've already kind of mentioned it before, but uh, Ed's has taken away and uh, how you see this race shaping up. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating race, isn't it? Uh, Major Dundee, as you say, the inform Alan King team. The horse has got to be respected. Uh, plenty of stamina in the locker. I mean, our power of those at the top of the market would be the, the, the most obvious one. I see Sam Thomas here saying off 136. They need to go and win this to go up in the weights in order to get into the big race at Newbury uh, at the end of November. He ran some really good races last year, didn't he? At Kempton, uh, finishing third to Christian Williams' horse. And then at the Shouting Festival itself, uh, which track wide, wasn't beaten a million miles by a Corrick Rambler uh, in the Ultima. Uh, again, so if you watch that race back, it's pretty smart form. Uh, so, but again, probably short enough for me in a competitive race. I thought the standout here. Now, I'm, I'm delighted to hear Stephen saying it's, it's 20 degrees and he's getting sunburnt and his uh, petunias are drying up and all sorts in the garden because uh, Danny Kerwin on a decent ground, right-handed, especially in Ascot, is, is an absolute machine. I, I think 12 to 1 is wrong if you can guarantee there's more good in the ground than soft by the time they go to post at Ascot because he's a two-time course winner here. He took the field apart uh, going back a couple of starts ago. I think he's off a mark of 133 
he could uh, he could easily make waves off. And, you know, Paul Nichols saying he's going to have him tuned up to the minute for his seasonal reappearance. He's a big player here on a right-handed track. In fact, all his wins in, uh, in the UK have come on right-handed tracks. I was there at Cheltenham at the October meeting last year where he tried to go around Cheltenham on Chase debut. And then he jumped into the stand on three occasions. I mean, he was going markedly right. Uh, add all his obstacles. So they've given up without any kind of left-handed angle here and they're going to stick to the Kemptons and the Ascots of this world. And he's got some smart form here. He loves good ground. Uh, if you could just keep those reins away, I, I think he's a, he's a major player. And I, I'd be shocked if he started a double-figure price, granted no worse than good to soft as they go to post. Well, especially now after that assessment, Ed, I think he's going to shorten right up. But uh, Stephen, just take us through your thoughts on the favourite again with Alan King. Tom Callan as well. That combination is working so well of late. Yeah, I really like Major Dundee. He's progressive. He's only had four runs over fences. He's a lot less exposed than most of these rivals. He ran an absolute screamer on his final start in the uh, Scottish National up to four miles for the first time, catching an absolute tartar on the day in Win My Wins. And he was the only one who tried to give Win My Wins a race. Um, Win My Wins cruised clear from about a mile out there. And Major Dundee was the only one to try and close that winner down and got tired from the last. Still ran an absolute blind. I mean, given plenty of time to recover. King flying. Um, back to three miles. Well, I'm not that worried because I think they're going to go a right gallop here. There's three or four confirmed front runners. Um, the one who I suspect to the tracks and market support is T Clipper, who's a very promising young chaser from a good yard, Tom Lacey, and ran really well at Chepstow first time up front running and just pegged right on the line the pair pulling well clear now t clipper has gone up three pounds for that defeat which a lot of people don't like um, but I, I don't think in this race when he's got fitness on his side it's going to matter that much I, I suspect there might be without being rude of certain horses on the day today i suspect horses like good boy bobby are going to struggle first time out um, rappers liable to need the run full back unless there was money for it It'd be very hard to fancy i mean We've got an old Ascot specialist here. I thought Ed was going to tip this one up. I must admit, Regal Encore, who's now 14. I mean, there can't be many 14-year-olds who are still competitive in these hot Saturday handicaps. But he's got an amazing Ascot record. I mean, I doubt he'd be good enough at the age of 14. I think it'll burst every sort of statistician's record books if he manages to win this race age 14 for Honeyball. But his record at Ascot... So you can look on irishracing.com. He's pretty incredible. He's won several of these big races and amassed so much prize money. But I was actually surprised to see he's still in training. <laughs> he could easily place, could he, couldn't he? Mm. Pick up the pieces late. I wouldn't be surprised. No. Great stuff. All right, well, that wraps it up for our kind of race previews. But now we're going to move on to our tips of the week. All right, so Stephen Harris, uh, take us through some of your top tips of the weekend, please. Yeah, we'll start off with the um, betting expert daily nap in the 3.15 at Ascot. Major Dundee, a young chaser going places from a really hot, inform yard. Um, I'm sure he'll be fitting well for this. Cannon booked. Um, drops back from four miles to three, but they're going to go such a strong gallop. I think he'll be able to stay in touch and hopefully overpower them late. Uh, he's around five to one, nine to two. I, I think you'd want that as a minimum. I suspect first time out in a competitive race, you probably should get six to one or bigger on the exchanges. Um, my betting expert value angle selection comes in the 130 at Ascot. Small field. I'm dying to take on Goshen. Uh, first time out over fences. I think he could get in a row on the lead with Gal Road and hopefully Cobbler's Dream will take to it first time out. A small yard who does really well, Ben Case. Um, he's a strapping chasing type. I liked him over hurdles. Um, he has got plenty to find on ratings or hurdles ratings with Goshen, but I think he could be a different proposition as a chaser and has a very good makeup here around about five to one. And my long shot, although as often happens, uh, Joe, these horses shorten up. You do the form a couple of days before looking at sort of eight to one. And I really do like Prashima in the three o'clock at Weatherby, uh, who is now around nine to two, five to one, unfortunately. But race fitness could count for plenty in that race. And I think Prashima will come on for that reappearance at Chepstow. Lovely stuff. Well, best of luck to you, Stephen, this weekend. And Ed, over to you of your selections. Yep, yeah, we're uh, Molly Ollie's wishes my nap in the uh, the Mayor's Hurdle at Weatherby. Uh, bolted up in this 12 months ago. Looks a match match bet against um, Lucy Wadham's horse. Uh, and I think it will just come out on top. Um, should be absolutely spot on. 
for this assignment. Uh, my value, I, I do think Danny Kerwin is, is a knocking each way bet in the uh, in the London Gold Cup. Two-time winner at Ascot. As long as the uh, the proviso being, as long as we don't get the absolute deluge, he's on soft ground, they might even pull him out. As long as the ground's decent there, I think Danny Kerwin could easily fill the, the top four at least. So he's my selection for the informed Paul Nichols team. And then I'm with Paul Nichols again with the second string in the Charlie Hall. Bryony Frost on Secret Investor. This horse is a phenomenal record when fresh. So although it's been an enforced freshness in the sense he picked up a little knock and he's been off the track for nearly two years, uh, Paul Nichols has said this is his gold cup. He will be absolutely trained to the minute for the Charlie Hall. Whereas I think there's perhaps that question whether there are other days ahead with perhaps a few of the others in there. So that's the angle I'm taking with Secret Investor as a, as a 12 to 1 Pope. So yeah, really looking forward to it. Should be a great day of racing at Ascot and especially Weatherby as well. So yeah, should be fun, Joe. Lovely stuff. Well, hopefully, yeah, you have a great time at Weatherby and we'll be back next week with actually a special show for the first time in years. We're actually all going to be together in the same studio. So be sure to check that out later on next week on irishracing.com. And also we'll be back on Monday for another review show with Johnny Ward and Emma Nagel. But for now, thanks a lot for watching. As always, if you do follow our expert selections, please do gamble responsibly. We'll be back very soon here on irishracing.com.